Hello, hi, welcome to my porch. And <laughs> this is the, I like to call her Dame Day. Like, do you like that, Dame Day? Sure. <laughs> Who wouldn't like to be called Dame? <laughs> I'd like to be called Dame. It wouldn't be the same kind of Dame as yours, probably, though. I don't know. <laughs> and so it goes. Um, hi, thanks hi. for doing this. My pleasure. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. Yeah. You look <laughs> wonderful. COVID hey. looks great on you. <laughs> Sorry. You look amazing. You look great. Thanks. Um, <laughs> you don't know any of these questions that are coming to you. I do. don't. I was I always don't. wondering if everyone would tell each other. Well, you guys have been pretty good about it. Good. That's really impressive. I guess that when you're sitting over there, you don't want anybody else to have any more forewarning than you did on the oh, question. Okay. That might be okay. part of it. Right? Okay. So what's your first memory of APT? My first memory of APT <laughs> was I came to see a show here at a, in Spring Green. Um, on the closing day of the 1980 season, so its very first season, mm. and saw Titus Andronicus in the afternoon, <laughs> and then I saw A Midsummer Night's Dream at night, and I, the thing I really took away was I just was amazed by the performances, and I have never been colder in my life than in um, early mid-October not really knowing what it would be like to be out. Were you prepared? But not at all. You were. But I was freezing, and I, but I wouldn't have left for the world because I was that mesmerized by the whole experience. And what were you doing at this time? I was living in Madison, and I had uh, I had just completed summer school, um, and then How graduated. I would have been twenty-two at the time, wow. or twenty-one. I would have been twenty-one, oh about gosh. to turn twenty-two. Yeah. So yeah. So when did you know that you wanted? you wanted to be here? Um, I had a friend who started working here whose name was Steve Hemming, oh, and he was an actor here. Was. And um, I had worked with him at a dinner theater in Madison called Wilson Street East. What did you is, do with him? I knew Steve we, about, yeah, yeah. But not as, obviously as well as you, but well, yeah, what did you do? We, we were in Oliver together, um, the musical, and he played Bill Sykes in mm. it. And I was Mrs. Sourberry, and we became good friends in that. And then we sort of always stayed in contact. And um, I came and saw him, and then saw him after a show. And he was like, "I think you'd like it here. I think you should audition." Why do you think he said that? I because we had sort of similar sensibilities about things. What's that mean? I just think that he thought that this would be a place where I could really learn and grow and be a part of it. And what about you? Do you think he thought would like that? Or what, what about you specifically? Because he had lots of friends, right? He did. He did. And he, um, I think because we were both sort of readers and interested in mm -hmm. stuff like that. And we mm -hmm. hadn't obviously done classical work together. But, um, yeah. And I just think he thought that this might be the, a good place. So was it right after undergrad? Uh, that This would have been, um, he was here in like middle 80s. I graduated in 1980 from the University of Wisconsin. And what did you study? You're so mean. I, I was know. a history mate. Were you? At the University see, now of see? Yeah. This is information people want to know. She was a history, history major. Yeah. And, and, and then you decided to be an actor. I had worked uh, at Wilson Street East while I was in college. And in fact, I had my first job there when I was 19 at Wilson Street East. I was in the play Funny Girl, playing Mrs. Straycosh in Funny Girl. You play Mrs. Straycosh? Yeah. yeah. The one who has Sadie, Sadie, yes. married lady. Yeah. That, that was, I was Sadie's mom. So, you were um, eight, ni eight, 19? 19, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I wish I'd seen that. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I, I went there and, while I was in college. And it was, I was being paid. We did eight shows a week, two on Wednesday, two on Saturday. And when did you know you wanted to be here? Well, I was scared out of my mind when he said, I'm going to, I think you should audition. And I wound up auditioning for APT in 1985, in the fall of 1985. And I remember it really clearly because it was everybody in the company, because everybody lived, came and watched people audition. <gasps> oh, and I didn't know that. Yeah. How intimidating is that? And it was in what the costume shop was, and everybody was around. In the barn? And, mm -hmm. and um, I remember coming up the stairs there, and Randy and Annie were there. And I did a couple of monologues, and um, I remember there was one part where Randy Kim laughed at what I did. What was the monologue? It was Cleopatra, and it was the line was, "Oh, happy horse to bear the weight of Antony," and Randy Kim laughed at it. And then you said, "I want to be here." 
I would love to be here. Well, in the meantime, what had happened was I, I received a letter um, saying, I'm sorry, we, we were not in need of anybody. They wound up closing in 1985. I had moved down to Chicago and uh, they closed in January of 1986. And then I, um, I remember my parents had sent me the front page of the Wisconsin State Journal saying that APT closed. Oh. And it was just, you know, oh, that's so sad. Within, within a little bit of time, Steve called me and said, it looks as though APT is going. Hi. They've driven by like three times now on his motorcycle. He's having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're going to be reopening, and I think you should uh, tell them that you'll audition for them. You'll go to Madison, they'll meet you in Chicago, you'll come up to Spring Green, and you'll audition for them. I'm like, oh, okay. And I called up the office and Sandy Ernst answered the phone mm -hmm. and she said, oh, okay, um, thank you. We'll, we'll look at setting up a date. She called me back a couple of hours later and said, oh, we remember your audition. We would like to invite you to be a member of the company. Because they had lost an actor in the middle of the time. And so they had time on her. That's fantastic. Yeah. And then you're like hooked. Kind of, yeah. Really? <laughs> the first year, just hooked? <laughs> yep. What about it? Um, I think I was, part of it was, um, I was very, I love the idea of company. And maybe that's because I'm an only child, that I love the idea of a company. And so that sort of, that working together for a common purpose and that family yeah. kind of quality was really important to me. Um, I was one of only three new people in the company when I came that year. Um, most of the people have been there since the beginning. And I really, I really enjoyed the experience. And I loved watching Randy mm -hmm. how he who he was as an actor was he could become anyone and I think that that was the exciting thing for me was that he was really brilliant yeah he was really brilliant and he really did feel that the job of an actor is to inhabit any sort of person and I had seen him at the guard theater just down the street here he had done uh, in 1979 before the theater opened he was doing a fundraiser uh, for this crazy thought that he was having of doing a, a classical theater company in Spring Green. And he started out in a makeup, very heavy makeup, doing... Um, hi. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, uh, doing On the Harmfulness of Tobacco. Oh, right. Oh. And then he took his makeup off, and for intermission, he then was Juliet. Wow. And he was Juliet. He was. It wow, was, I never heard that story. Yeah, yeah, and it was just amazing to see this character in, on, in on the harmful piece of tobacco that he and Juliet. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's just the most amazing person. That's ever. amazing. Oh. And of course, you came to get rich. <laughs> <laughs> Incredibly wealthy. You're getting paid big dollars. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember when I saw where you lived. Mm -hmm. I had met you, and I was like, wow, and you were so spectacular and um and then i ended up out where you were living and you were living in a i lived in for the first seven years i was at ABT. seven years i'm going to say that she lived in this for seven years okay go it was a cabin that it was hardly a cabin but go ahead nice <laughs> what, it was, what it was it was out at hilltop which is a beautiful beautiful place out in the wyoming valley and it had been a one-room schoolhouse that had been purchased you could buy when they were disbanding um, the whole idea of uh, one-room schoolhouses throughout the uh, throughout the state. You could buy a one-room schoolhouse for a dollar if you could move it. And the person who uh, <laughs> whose land I was on had been a an apprentice with Frank Lloyd Wright, and he had moved several cabins, several um, one-room schoolhouses to this area. And I wound up um, living there. I loved it. There were horses out behind where I was. I didn't have running water because that electricity. Makes, I did have electricity. Oh, and this, when I tell that story, there's no electricity. Oh, that's very sweet. You're stumbling around in the dark yeah. for yeah. your art. I mean, right. it's... But it was just like, well, if Shakespeare and Chekhov could, could not have, didn't have running water, I could not have running water. And so I thought I'd be there for a year. And then it was just, I really loved it. And I think my rent was $75 a month, which was pretty good. <laughs> it went all the way up to 175 by the time I left, I think. Oh but And gosh. I loved the people that Leasing were out there. you. Yeah. yeah. You had to be coaxed out of that place. <laughs> Not really, though. I, don't, I remember. I mean, you were, where were you living? I think when I came in 95, you were I living. I was living out at, the, at my house. Your house. Yeah. yeah, your house. 
yeah. out of your house. Yeah. So you just kind of knew. You knew when you got here that first season that if you could, you'd mm -hmm. stay. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, John Lang's see, it's a history major, so you knew the history. It's amazing. John Lang's, um, when I, you know John, um, <laughs> when he worked here the first year, um, he was very young, right? And, and he, he came out with this, you know, people say BPT kind of person, so Dara came in and said, we we'll hire this guy. I think you'll like this guy. So we hired him, and, um, and the second year when I asked him to come back, I talked to him about coming back, he said, he did a really beautiful job, right? You've been missing lines, right? Yeah. It was so lovely of you, Matt. Yeah. Yes, I was. I was joking. I said, I just <laughs> set you up. So you were in his very first piece. Yes. You were in a lot of his pieces. Yes. Um, he said, when I asked him to come back the second year, he said, it, he said, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like walking through fire to work there. So, and what do you think he meant by that? What I love about APT is there's nothing there's nothing easy about um, it. It takes a lot of stamina and strength and perseverance and dedication. And at the best, you make it look like it's easy. Mm -hmm. But between the heat and the bugs and the cold and the animals that may walk on stage or anything, there's just nothing about it that doesn't require everything. And I remember the first time that I was then working at other theaters and it was like, it feels like I, I literally didn't even break a sweat, and I didn't understand. And it's like, oh, I am so used to, well, I can get through that. I can do that. You just do it. And it was just always, it's really, it's, there's nothing about it that's easy. So the person that's interested in that is attracted to this place. A lot of people that have done these interviews have spoken to that fact. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think that does to the rehearsal room? Because I think he was talking about the rehearsal room, too. Because everybody who is here, um, you want, you have to want to be here. And yeah. that's, um, that's, it's, it isn't usually, well, this is a job. This is a job. Um, it's not really what it is. It's like you're making a commitment to the other people that are in the room. It's like how we are with COVID and wanting to be socially distant. We're not do we're not wearing a mask and doing all that stuff for ourselves. We're doing it for the other people there, and that's yeah. not always easy. Yeah, it's not. It's not. And you guys are always. Everyone, I feel like the bar gets set pretty high, and a new director walking into that, it's a very different feeling. Yeah. Someone like I bet. you. How many times? You, I mean, you, you experience actors. Every time I talk to a person about doing a Shakespeare play here, they'll say, great, oh, your actors are so good at Shakespeare. I'd, I'd love to do Shakespeare for you. And then they, eventually they'll do the math, the kind of accumulation of years that are in the room on any right. given play. How many times have, tell me some of the most, the plays you've done the most, and which plays have you done the most? Um, I think Mary Wives I've probably done the most, which is always, it's such a it's such a treat that it's mentioned in Jamie's um, and a probable fiction. <laughs> because there's something about it that feels so much of a real gift for our audience. Mm -hmm. It's because it's about community and it's about love of a community and being a member of a community. And it's um, it's such a treat of a play to be able to do for people. It feels mm -hmm. very loving. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's when you've done the most? Yeah. yeah. What are the, how many times have you done it? Well, it was my very first season. I you was played en page. I was en page, sweet en page, and I think Randy might have been, might have, might have been, um, or the doctor. Yeah, he the was doc the doctor. He was the doctor. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, and it was you were en page. And then I understudied Mistress Ford, and then I played Mistress uh, Page, and then I have done Mistress Quickly twice. <laughs> So yeah, it, I, yeah. I, Do you yeah. know all the lines when you're sitting oh, gosh, in the rehearsals? No. Gosh, no. Ready gosh, I think I could talk along to some of those plays. <laughs> Certainly in the monologues. <laughs> in those plays. I could probably talk along to some of those monologues. Um, what have you been most proud of? I'm most proud of the really beautiful growth that the theater has taken and that uh, the dedication of our audiences mm -hmm. and their sharing it and how it's grown 
um, both in uh, its growth has been a really beautiful thing to to see and be a part of. Because when you were first here, how mm -hmm. big were those audiences? Well, the theater held about 700, and I think four to five would be a really wonderful night. We did have some full houses, mm -hmm. but um, but you know, in the early years, I didn't get here until the seventh season. Right, right. But in some of those first years, they were they were <laughs> they were small. That is my understanding. Yeah, but, yeah. But and there were times when payroll couldn't be met, and there were a couple of angels who were a part of making payroll happen. Right, um, um, and actors who went without paychecks at times, and so, and I was never a part of that. It was always you always were. Okay. Yeah. Um, how has it grown besides the audience? Well, we just we've been we've had wonderful leadership, obviously, that has wanted to make sure that we're growing as far as um, the real support of it between language. Um, voice and text people, um, it's, it's gone through, it, it, it is a much more exciting theater than it had been. But um, how it began, the dream of how it began mm -hmm. is still such a, such an anomaly um, right. that I think I still hold on to some of the beautiful dreams of what the theater had been. But to see it come to the kind of fruition of this is really amazing. Yeah, I mean, to have your perspective from mid '80s to now, I mean, I, I think about it, just in the time I've been here, uh, just how I'm, I wasn't aware of how much we've changed um, until I started to really analyze it, like go back and really look at production photos, and we had a couple of videos, and and um, I never not believed what we were doing was really great. I mean, I never thought I never think something's terrible. I mean, I'm sure people think some things are terrible. And I've, there's only been a couple times I've been like, we all never seen, I mean, I never didn't see that again. But only like in 20, but you know, I never thought while we were doing it that it was, that it was always pretty Herculean. So therefore, the effort and the, the kind of spirit always seemed to carry so much of what we were looking for was watching it. Which is real people doing things, real, real, mm -hmm. you know. And I feel like the, the atmosphere at APT is, it's a kind of an active kind of spirit, and that shows up on stage to me all the time. But it has changed a lot. Yeah. And and when I try to characterize the change, I know what kind of words I'm struggling to find because I do think that the essence of it, the core value of it, um, people that are really dedicated to this story. As I hope, I, I hope that never changes. But other things have really grown. Mm -hmm. And what, what, how would you characterize the last like? I mean, you said it growth. Mm -hmm. It's growth. How would you characterize the growth over the years when David first came, and then as David went through his his um, work here? It, um, there's so many. There's so many beautiful um, aspects of what those changes uh, meant. Because um, the first years under the leadership of Randy and Annie were about, oh, can we? Can we? Yeah. Can we? And it's like, well, we're dedicated to this, and we're working on a play, and we're not working toward an opening night. We're hoping that by the time we close this in October, we've gotten it right. Maybe 2% of the time. Mm -hmm. There was always a, well, we're just going to keep working on it and trying to get better. And um, that we were always changing things within the course of the season um, as far as uh, keep learning and keep working on things. And now it, it was becoming much more of a um, wanting to be able to have a really good show with opening night. And it, it will get better by the end of it. But that was never sort of where Randy and Annie were. It really uh -huh. was about, um, I think they really had a feeling that actors, 
I mean, they named it American Players Theater. Right, of course. And it had to do with, I don't want it to be American Directors Theater. And I don't, it, it's like, we're going to be, we did the plays uncut using Shakespeare's words. And there was a real dedication to making sure that you knew exactly what it was that you were saying at any given point. And then it became something of a shift and wanting to update some things and to change some things in order to make it accessible. And that was really important because I think it brought in audiences that felt they couldn't quite handle what it was before. And that's wonderful, is that there were people that were now, oh, I'm understanding this in a much, much clearer way. I'm wanting to make sure that it is always um, people working hard at wanting to make sure that we're telling the story in a way that's, that's giving an audience the value of the story. It's interesting because I think that we still really value language and story. Mm -hmm. And you say this, and I think that everything is always a, a get, it, everything's a win and lose. Mm -hmm. If you're going to, you know, cut the plays, you're going to lose the kind of purity and the kind of mm -hmm. essence of what it may have been when Shakespeare tried to, you know, do his plays. What it may have been, like what it may have been for that audience, what they had to invest. Mm -hmm. um, and I see, like, over time, the investment of the audience is, people always talk about our audiences. And Jimmy talked about, like, first year he was here, like, he'd never experienced an audience that sat for three hours in the rain, like, watching. <laughs> and now, you know, that's kind of like, compared to what Randy was after, which is four and a half hours of, you know, yeah. top, top and out. Um, it seemed like, you know, a little bit lazy, you know, <laughs> a little bit lazy to get to that three hour mark. You know, when I have to tell directors, you have to get it in <laughs> under three. Hamlet gets three twenty. Richard the Third, you know, three ten. You know, I mean, you start yeah. having those negotiations, yeah. but yeah. Um, it's interesting because every time you do something like that, you lose something, but you gain something. I've just learned yeah. it over time, and um, I think it's an interesting. And transition. you decide what hill is worth dying on for you yeah. at any moment. Yeah, and that's. And I mean, one of the things that I so loved about David was him saying that when he first came. Um, he said, I would not have had the imagination for that kind of grit to be able to, to begin a theater. Right. And that kind the of... The entrepreneurial kind of feeling. Yeah. yeah. And that, that all-in kind of a thing that, 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 that is part of it. But he could be able to sustain it yeah. and allow it to grow. Yeah, and that's it. And the, the thing is that, that the beginner's, um, the founder's mind, can't always sustain itself because it's like it has thrown everything. Right. And uh, the kind of, not, I'm just saying how they were wanting to do Shakespeare on cut. And um, it's like there was an integrity about it. Not that I'm sick, but it was like this is what we're, there's a purity. There's a purity. There's yeah, purity. purity. It's almost it. a purity about it. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that, yeah, because it's hard to talk about things as if something else has less integrity. Than something yeah, else. I, I that's told, not what I, I mean. I knew you that didn't is mean not that. But I do think that there are choices that um, some people would say that is without integrity. Once you start cutting things, once you start um, contemporizing yeah. um, the settings of things, and, um, then you are losing some integrity of the piece. But uh, not by it's a purity. It's a purity it's a purity. From my, from my perspective. And it certainly has shifted a lot in the last 10 years. I mean, mm -hmm. in the last 10 years, I've seen a big change in growth in the theater. Mm -hmm. um, how would you characterize that? There have been. I mean, the, the difference of literature that we've been able to do has just been an exciting, has been so exciting to see the different changes that have been happening in that. And to have more American stories and more stories about um, things other than, I remember somebody saying, if I have to see another place where London is the big town, I'm just <laughs> over it. And kind of go, oh yeah, we make this about the people that are that are part of our audience, something that, that speaks more clearly. Right. But... Um, I love that. Yeah, I love those American plays. Yeah. Lots of people talk about those. Yeah. Um, what do you wish you could? I want to hear what you're proud of, most proud of in, for yourself in the work, your work. Did you pick something you're most proud of? I guess just that I've been allowed to, to keep doing it <laughs> is the idea. I mean, this is my 35th season, and there is no way I would have ever thought that they would be done on little boxes on somebody's computer. That Gosh. that would have been how my 35th season <laughs> at American Players Theater would be is not what I would have thought. So um, I think what I'm proud of is that I have been able to be adaptable both as a person and mm -hmm. as an actor. 
to adapt to being a 27-year-old that came here and was playing Sweet on Page, and then being somebody who's playing Mistress Quickly in a box uh, is you kind of go, oh, I guess I've adapted, and that's a sign of a good and strong life. I'm so glad you said that about yourself. I didn't have to say that. <laughs> no, but you know how I feel about you. I mean, you know I adore you, and that I have watched you. Um, I joke and call you the poster child for company. And, and I mean, it was and, always. And I mean, you went through some tra hard, rough times. Yeah, in there. Of like, can you talk about that a little bit? How, when it got hard for you? Um, like when did it get? It got hard for a while. Like I think there you couldn't see the thirty-five years. I don't know that you trusted the thirty-five years was ever going to come. Oh yeah. I mean, I think I went through just different phases of, oh, this is hard, and life is hard, and what, what seems ahead is hard. And I think I got very, um, I kept my eyes off of the prize for a while. Uh -huh. That's something that happens to a lot of people uh -huh. during the course of a lifetime. And um, the and prize I, change? I think I had sort of world events sort of took over some yeah. places with things yeah. and then I had some personal things that happened that were uh, about loss and figuring things out that yeah it just it was a tough times in there and yeah and you but, were and here through it all I mean through it all yeah well when you have 35 <laughs> of anybody's time of life you know 35 years is going to be a chunk a of joke. somebody's life yeah and it's interesting because you I mean I call you the, the like you're so graceful it's not an act like this is who she is and I think that that's not a um, that's not an easy thing, especially in this profession. Um, the 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 thing is, I've been talking to somebody about the fact that I am uh, because I'm uh, I'm kind of not part of the industry. Um, I am I am an incredibly fortunate actor who um, has obviously the majority of my career has been here in Spring Green. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've been fortunate enough to work some other places, but it, it, mine isn't about the industry and making sure that I know what the industry standards of something are. I'm, I've been able to be some of the focuses on the literature and the work of the theater, and I feel incredibly fortunate about that. Many people over time, especially, I mean, I remember when White Knight first took the job and started talking to David about a company, and I said, like, how do we keep these people here? Mm -hmm. And we were talking about it, and um, and I talked to someone that we know, so she'll remain nameless, who said, we can't have a company anymore. People become too entitled and they get they get entrenched and then they don't grow anymore. They get nervous, they get, they get lazy. And I was like, I just had this deep, deep instinct that the folks that were working here to begin with, that were sticking around that we wanted to, were not lazy. Like that was not gonna be the, the thing. I, do you think that there was times when you thought you, you kind of were like, sitting back and then times where you were well I think my hardest point is where I'm just going oh, just do that fine I'll just do that and it was I was getting lazy and that's when I think I was at my worst because I let myself um, I was dissatisfied with my own laziness and I think that that then spewed a lot of awful things not for very long though I mean it, it didn't last long. I mean, it, it didn't. Snap out of it. Snap, snap out, out of it. Come on, Day. But, but no, I, I, I really wanted to ask, talk about that because I think that that's yeah. a really, um, it's a really specific perspective and one that I, I think it, I've witnessed you. Um, what I would say is just, like I said, one of the most tremendously graceful transitions through, you know, you played on page and then you played all those leads, those leading ladies. And then you started to move into some of the older leading ladies. And then you were playing the aunts and the mom. I mean, how many times have you played? I mean, I just, it's I got a lot of nieces and nephews. You got a lot of nieces and nephews. <laughs> and you were, and the fact that you would, you would take those things on without it becoming about something you couldn't, it was something you couldn't control. Aging is part of the, the deal, right? Yeah. And most of the people in our business that are on film and stuff like they just don't get to age. Right. They just disappear. Yeah. And I feel like you have just become braver, and and I mean I love directing you, obviously. And You're, yeah, and it's such a joy. It's you you challenge in the most beautiful ways, and just kind of go, 
yeah, I know she knows me, and I know she's like slicing into a little <laughs> something there. And okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay. Oh, now she's letting up on me. I know. Okay. Now I know what I need to. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but it's so much fun. Yeah. But you're yeah. so open, and you're so you're so. Uh, that's what I just hope for life is like to keep doing that thing that makes you stronger and better. Yeah. And you only get stronger and better by risking and failing, and, and that's harder to do as you get older. Don't you think? Yeah, because. Um, because you, you can't you know, sort of, um, along with the physical vulnerabilities that happen with aging, you kind of want to go, but I, I want I want to be able to be vulnerable and, and, you know, keep cracking open. If there's anything that this 2020 year is uh, bringing open is so much about discovering your own vulnerabilities and you go, okay, this heart is cracking and opening and I want to go, yep. It breaks because the light needs to get in. Just get vulnerable. Just keep vulnerable. Yeah. Um, what would you wish you could just do over? Uh, if you could pick something. Do over. Do over. Like that didn't happen. I'm going to do that over. Let's pretend like that never happened. Oh, gosh. There's not a lot. Oh my God, that's a good answer to a question like that. That is a really good question that I didn't realize that I felt that way. <laughs> um, yeah, I. Yeah, I think I. <laughs> I was gonna think of some person I knew you dated when I first met you. <laughs> <laughs> oh golly. <laughs> oh, that's golly. not fair. Um, really, so that's good. You have nothing to do over performances or or perhaps a relationship well, relationship at the theater or uh, interaction or I wish I had been uh, kinder to a lot of people there are a lot of people that I think I was I was too judgmental I mean that's the, the worst part of me to me right now is realizing how much judgment I'm in and not dealing with compassion and um, working through compassion and kindness I think is the only I think I, I was filled with a lot of judgment toward myself, and then that spewed out to other people. And I wish I, um, I can only do, I can't do anything yesterday. I can only do today. And that's what I wish, is that I had more compassion. That's a nice, me. honest answer. I could answer that the same way. <laughs> I'm glad that everybody who says what they regret, I'm like, me too. So. <laughs> okay. That's a good idea. I should, yeah. Okay. So, or a place all about words, right? APT, yeah. all about words, right? Mm -hmm. We think language is really important, like in our mm -hmm. communications and in our, mm -hmm. and in our work. So what's your favorite word? Credenza. You knew that really well. You just knew that. You've always liked it. It's like a James Lipton thing, isn't it? Because yeah. I remember, yeah. Credenza. Credenza. And I remember there was somebody's office who had one. And I'm like, I love that word. Credenza. Yeah. That's a good word. Credenza. <laughs> what's your least favorite word? Um... Spew. <laughs> it's like moist. <laughs> is that your least favorite? I don't know. Someone said moist one day to me, and I said, that's a bad word. <laughs> that is not moist. Moist, moist just says what it makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask you, like, what's your, this is the last question. Okay. And you already talked a little bit about this, but uh, what would be, the one piece of advice you could give yourself as a little girl. You were sitting there with her and the things you know now, little Sarah, mm -hmm. like what would you wish that she knew that she, you just didn't figure out until later? Um, to embrace your imagination. Even there. Yep. You, did you have a good imagination when you were little? It was okay. Yeah. Were you worried but, about the... But it was a little odd, and the thing is, I was an only child, and um, I think a lot of only children live a lot in um, imagination, mm -hmm. and um, I think that it was also sort of embarrassing to have that kind of imagination, mm -hmm. as opposed to being out and being with your brothers and sisters and doing stuff and all that kind of stuff, and I think I would only, oh, I really don't think about that, or I'll pretend I'm a princess in the mirror, and you know, and to kind of continue with that. Just and embrace owning it. that, yeah. owning that in a way. Was yeah. It, yeah, I wish I'd have known you as a little girl. <laughs> I, one of my favorite things about you, Sarah, is the the affection and love that you have. Um, you may have been an only child, but I think you may have had one of the richest families. I, 
I've ever heard about. Like when so you talk about your family. Oh, the they richness in your family. Yeah. And the way you... Not wealth. But not wealth. <laughs> okay. No. Sorry, I know that are people who are wealthier than you. But, <laughs> but like the, the, the kind of richness in yeah. your family. That you had such extraordinary relationships with your parents. Yeah, I, I was really lucky. I was... Um, I used to describe it as I was the only child of what at the time were older parents in the sense that my mother was 35 when I was born <laughs> and they'd been married for 10 years and that was, oh, yeah. they were very worried that this was a very late pregnancy in 35 yeah. and I think you're one of the only people I know who had a child in her 20s. I mean, that, oh, everybody, that's interesting. that everybody else, has, they were in their yeah. 30s and my dad was nearly 40 and um, so it was... And I, I knew that I was a wanted child, and I was sort of would just sort of be tagging along with them to a different events in a different way that that you know when there's lots of kids, kids can't just come along. So I was always kind of around older people, and I I admire both of them. incredibly intelligent, and kind. Yeah, we're lucky to have you, Sarah. Thank you. I love lucky you. to be here. I love, I love you too. I love you too. Thank you.